I think I'm very different from many people here for whom mm, the, the democratic ed education is the thing. For me, I've actually come from a Rudolf Steiner background, which is at least on the superficial level, the very opposite of a democratic school, <laughs> because most of the decisions are taken by the teacher who is supposed to have great authority in the classroom, and it's supposed to be good mm -hmm. that he is a, he's a leader and that the children follow, and the children would not make many choices in the Rudolf Steiner school, especially not when they are younger, and that is supposed to be the good thing. Whereas in the democratic setting, it's the bad thing. This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Just a quick note, today's episode is a little different. I messed up the recording, so my side of the conversation is hard to hear and cannot be seen. If you can't make out what I'm saying, I suggest viewing with the captions on. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I'm here with Pavel Kramer. Um, and uh, you're from? The Czech Republic. Czech Republic, that's right. And you help schools uh, in what way? Tell, tell us how you help schools. Well, um, I help the schools in their development because uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, there has been a, uh, many other schools spreading, sprouting out uh, everywhere in the country. So uh, very often parents start a school because they are not very happy with what the state schools do. But uh, the parents may not have the experience, uh, the know-how, I have, so I'm helping these groups um, to to start a good school, mm -hmm. or there are other schools that have, uh, that want to transform, mm -hmm. that want to become better, that want to become a better place for children. Mm -hmm. So I uh, help those to develop further, yeah. to deepen their ways of seeing the children, um, restructuring the school, uh, to cope with the real needs of the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we're at the uh, International Democratic Education Conference in Nepal, so that's where we met. Uh, just want to just in case there's extra sound or something, whatever that mm -hmm. that we can know how we're in together. Um, so, how does the, the work that you do is it all with democratic schools or is there a variety of schools in Nepal? So, in the Czech Republic, um, thirty years ago. Um, we had the fall of communism, also called the Velvet Revolution. And only after the Velvet Revolution, uh, there was an opening in the educational area as well as in other areas. So only then we could open alternative schools. So um, the first to open may have been the Steiner schools, the Steiner mm -hmm. schools, Waldorf mm -hmm. schools. And Montessori schools followed a couple of years later. Homeschooling was also allowed. Um, and then many other school models um, came also later, but as far as democratic education is concerned, it's basically a matter of the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So um, I've been helping all of those uh, school, all of the all of those school educational models, mm -hmm. and both state schools and um, private schools and schools that don't exist as a legal entity, that are not mm -hmm. official. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me about like kind of how you got there. Like, I think you mentioned you said parents are more than happy. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about that, how it came about. Well, I don't actually think I'm a typical school founder. Uh -huh. I prefer other people founding schools and me helping them mm -hmm. to deepen their vision. Um, but uh, I actually did start two schools and I did almost start a third one mm -hmm. which I actually led for a couple of years so I was in the position of somebody being responsible for the vision for the pedagogical part of the school so uh, you would like me to mention all of them how do you want them tell us where you were yeah well I, I will <laughs> um, I 
may start with the first one. <laughs> um, it was actually something I did not quite, um, I did not succeed at, but mm -hmm. I think the idea was interesting, maybe interesting to some listeners. So um, after um, after having worked in the Czech Republic uh, for four years in the field of uh, law spine education, mm -hmm. I moved on to Switzerland, uh, worked two years in Switzerland. Uh, after that, I moved on to Ukraine, where I also worked another four years. And so that I was in the mood of traveling, uh, moving from one country to the other, learning languages, learning the kind of people speaking in different countries. Um, and I thought that would be actually a good idea also for the young people, mm -hmm. you know, to start even earlier than I started. So I thought for teenagers it would be great to have a traveling school, a school that travels from one place to the other. And my idea was that first they would learn um, the language of the country they are going to move to, to some extent of course, and then um, moving to the other country, they would learn in the other country. Also, they would enjoy the, the travel. They would slowly mm -hmm. travel from one place to the other, uh, exploring whatever you can explore on the way from one country to the other. And having uh, arrived in the country with the language they had already um, learned to some extent, they would carry on deepening the language um, expertise of this particular language but then also slowly starting a new language. Mm -hmm. And that would be the language where they, are, where, would be, uh, where they were supposed to go on later. Mm -hmm. So that was my basic idea and uh, kind of build other things around this basic idea. Um, but somehow <laughs> I was not successful. I actually did open the school, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be something else because the people with whom I opened that, mm, they may have had different inclinations so what it actually eventually became is more of a school of a for self-development of young adults. Mm -hmm. So whatever you don't learn at the university, uh, where mm, the, the learning is very much academic, mm -hmm. so the more soft part, the soft competencies. So that w that is what it became. Yeah, but uh, I think the mistake I did, I should have started before. Mm -hmm. Because I should have started when I had the most fire in myself, you know, I, when I was most excited, uh, excited uh, about my idea. But, you know, it took quite a few years until I got some people that were interested in my idea. Mm -hmm. But then it seemed to have been too late for myself, having already shifted to other interests, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so, so, were you kind of being a democratic education sort of thinking, like a group, or, or uh, like, like, how did you come, like, what is, why, why are you at IDEC? Like, what, what yeah, well, doing? it's, I think I'm very different from many people here for whom mm, the, the democratic education is the thing. For me, I've actually come from a Rudolf Steiner background, which is at least on the superficial level, the very opposite of a democratic school. <laughs> Because most of the decisions are taken by the teacher who is supposed to have um, great authority uh, in the classroom and it's supposed to be good mm -hmm. that he is a, he's a leader and uh, the children follow and the children would not make many choices in the Rolf Steiner school, especially not when they are younger mm -hmm. and that is supposed to be the good thing, mm -hmm. whereas in the democratic setting it's the bad thing. But uh, the thing is that having worked for, let's say, more than 10 years in the Waldorf movement, I've actually realized that um, very often the schools in this, um, in this movement become very dogmatic, mm -hmm. very, um, very much, um, it's a set of practices, uh, in a set structure of the, the school is doing, and there is not much movement there. And there is a lot of things people believe there, and they just do things because, uh, well, somebody said you are supposed to do that, mm -hmm. and may not understand why. Uh, so um, I actually tried to reform this movement. I have started a teacher training uh, of for Waldorf teachers uh, mm -hmm. when I was 35. That is 12 years ago. 
and I tried to help um, for an opening to come in this particular movement, inviting the most interesting people around Europe, even one from the United States, uh, where I had a feeling that they, they actually wanted to contribute an opening and to developing further uh, this kind of education, contribute to, the, to more variety to be there, etc. Mm -hmm. So that was my first job I did uh, in uh, adult uh, adult training. Mm -hmm. And I also was only partly successful. My idea was that um, many people from outside, from other movements, not from the spinal movement, they would come to the seminar because I designed it in a way to be very open, not to be dogmatic. But only a few people came from outside. There were some very experienced spinal teachers who had been teaching for 15 even more years. And they came because they also had the feeling I had that the, mo the movement is becoming too, too structured, too closed, and they very liked the idea of opening. Mm -hmm. But the people from the other movements, they did not come, only a few of them did. So after that, okay, my idea was, um, well, it's my turn. I have to go to meet these people in the other pedagogical movements, mm -hmm. rather than waiting for them to come. So then I quit the Low Spinal Movement, which was like 10 years ago, approximately, and started my own institute, the Institute for Support of Alternative and Innovative Education, and started going to conferences of all sorts, Montessori conferences, homeschooling conferences, democratic school conferences, and many other conferences that were there. Even those that wanted to reform the state school system, uh, not starting other schools, but like uh, more of an evolution of state schools. So mm -hmm. I was very much present in all of these movements and uh, I'm very grateful for this experience because I could have gained a very deep insight into each of these uh, educational streams mm -hmm. and what is their vision, what are the problems they are uh, grappling with right in the moment and all the rest of it. And that's how I also came to the democratic schools. Uh, I think it must have been like 10 or 11 years ago, I attended the first meeting of um, democratic school people in the Czech Republic. At that time, there was no democratic school, no Sudbury school. But that was the meeting of people who were excited about this idea. Basically, it was young people. And that was the first live meeting. These people have had some, meet, uh, had had some meetings um, before. For two years, they were only meeting online. And they were translating some material from, from the US about, um, um, about the Sudbury schools. Um, they they translated parts of Summerhill, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever was there. Uh, I think they also um, translated some videos that were available. And only after two years, there was the first meeting. It was a there were like 120 people mm -hmm. in quite a small <laughs> hall, and it was very chaotic. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents with their children, uh, but it was also very joyful. So that's my first meeting democratic school movement mm -hmm. and only and then eventually out of that uh, after one two years uh, first democratic schools started in, in the Czech Republic by now we have around 15 of them wow. and uh, that it are only the registered one those that are official I think all of them are private if I'm not mistaken, but officially registered by the state, actually doing quite well with the state inspection, which was a very surprise for me. How is that possible? <laughs> because they don't force children to learn what is in the curriculum. They give them opportunities, that, but it's the child that is eventually choosing what to learn and if to learn at all. Mm. So it's very surprising that um, it's more or less okay with the Czech authorities. But as I say to many people, I actually have the feeling that the Czech Republic may be the most liberal country in Europe or even the world in terms of education, mm -hmm. in terms of this educational experiments, educational uh, alternatives. 
so our state is very much supportive of our candidates. So uh, having said, we have 15 of them. Uh, there is an indefinite number of others that are not official, mm -hmm. so say under the radar. So I suppose they might be around 10 or even more uh, school communities uh, that are also following the democratic school model, but are not as school officially. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and that's why I came here. That is my first, this is my second Interna um, international meeting of people from democratic schools. The first one was a couple of months ago in Bulgaria, which was the UDEC, mm -hmm. which is the the European uh, the European meeting of democratic schools. Cool. And now we are in IDEC, which is the worldwide network. Yeah, yeah brilliant. So, so I'm seeing that there's some very similar sentiments as ways uh, of thinking in Virginia. You know, that's you know going to a lot of conferences has been our path for mm -hmm. a while, um, and, and 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 also having that openness to changing the state school. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've gone to conferences that were almost entirely made up of people working in education. And public education yes, and great. And so, so, so I think that's a, that's a good indication. Um, so so. It, it is also kind of interesting that that, that kind of openness is discussed in government, um, in which you know, I know nothing about. <laughs> um, uh, I know a little tiny bit about the uh, the double revolution. Um, mm -hmm. There's a friend of mine wrote a book in Vaclav Havel about the Polish students. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. um, so uh, you know, you mentioned. Uh, Václav Havel was our first president after we became a free nation, that is free from communism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that he actually um, did visit the first Waldorf school in Prague mm -hmm. on the first day when it opened. Mm -hmm. So um, I was only 15 then. I did not know anything about these kind of schools, but after I did see photographs of President Havel visiting the school where later on I worked for a couple of day, a couple of years on the very first day of uh, of opening. It was very nice. Yeah, yeah. So he was personally supportive of uh, diversity in uh, education and culture. Right. So that's also why we have we may have the most rich and the most bright uh, theater scene uh, mm -hmm. in Prague. I've not heard of any other city in the world having as many theaters as we have. And they are very much supported by the state or by the uh, by the local um, local um, Prague district governments. Mm -hmm. So mm, they get a financial aid and um, they are actually doing well. Yeah. And that's very much because of uh, Václav Havel. Right, right. It demonstrates that, that, yeah. that that leadership can set a set of direction right. and that will persist even beyond their leadership. So yes. they're, you know, they're occupying whatever topic. Yeah, that's really neat because that, 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 you know, that it's important to understand like the, the different leverages that we have to make mm. these kinds of changes. And sometimes it's going to be very tedious mm. um, if there happens to be an opportunity to do that. Um, but also, you know, that you think through uh, even deeper Levels that, that rely on change to be great. Um, so, so thinking about your school, like as someone who helps schools and students to perform or to get started, mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you help them understand their relationship, not just as a school, but their relationship to governments and inspectors and things like that? Is there a particular way that you uh, you know talk about that? How they should deal with that? Okay, um, yes, it's one part of my work. So when um, consulting uh, uh, an opening of a new school, it's one of the one of the uh, one of the issues that I talk about with people, or actually they ask me because they are of course aware of that of the respect. Um, and uh, it's particularly important if you start a school because once you have started a school. Um, basically, and after the first year has passed, which is the 
of the year, the first inspection, mm -hmm. if all of that goes well, then basically the state lets, lets you be. So whatever mm -hmm. you do in the school afterwards, um, the, the inspection is not very strict, so mm -hmm. usually it's okay. So, but it's very important at the beginning, because it's the state that decides if, if it gives you the permission to open the school or not. So, uh, it of course depends on whether it is a state school or a private school. It's quite difficult to open a state school, um, but it does happen even now, um, sometimes. It was very, um, it was very easy to start an alternative state school early in the, in the, early in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So there was like one or two years after the Velvet Revolution, there were, I think, five or six water schools that were opened uh, by the state in the state setting. Mm -hmm. And they are still there. And even now, they are the, the largest China schools. Mm -hmm. So that means that probably still the majority of children who who go to China schools might be in state school too. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, and the same with Montessori uh, a couple of years uh, later, there was still an opening. But after the first 10 years of freedom, as anywhere else, uh, the state became more restrictive. Mm -hmm. And it became very difficult to start a state school. So nowadays you can only start a state school if, for instance, there is a small town or a village and it, ha it had a school before, like 30 years ago in the communist time, and um, then it closed down because there are not many children there and because in the new capitalist era everything has to be effective, so it may not be effective to teach only a handful of children. So they closed down, and then for some reason there are some, th the village or town becomes attractive again for new families because it's uh, wonderful, uh, nature is around or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then new children come. And then you can actually address the um, people, in the local government, um, and, uh, and ask them to open a school, which they actually should. Because if there is a lot of children, they should care after their, um, they should care about their education. So then you can open a school uh, by this, uh, you know, within the state system, and it can be ho totally alternative. Mm -hmm. If the people, uh, on the board of the um, town, don't mind. Why not? Yeah. You know. So it's happening. Uh, so uh, oh, by the way, uh, so some people try that, and I, I mean, I was invited a couple of times to the meeting of the town council, council mm -hmm. or city council, mm -hmm. uh, and my job was to convince the people. Uh, the deputies, uh, that it's a good idea to start an alternate school. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not always successful because the problem is that <laughs> quite a few deputies in such local settings very often are school directors of the classical schools. Yeah. So they actually don't like this idea at all <laughs> to have some competition because then what might happen is that many children actually leave their schools and um, try to get into the new other school. <laughs> so, um, yeah, mm, they don't have the majority of the votes, but um, they are a strong presence. Mm -hmm. And because also other people there, some of them may not know anything about ed education, we always have this issue of the very conservative director sitting there. But sometimes it is successful, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, that is for the people who want to start a um, school in, uh, in the, in, uh, within the state school system. But more often people ask me to give them some advice on uh, starting a school, a private school. Mm -hmm. So then um, uh, it's much more complicated. So the first thing I help them with, how to establish a legal body that would be, that would be the founder of the school or that would be the school itself. So mm -hmm. both of them are possible. And you have several possibilities in the Czech Republic. You can start an NGO. You have two different uh, kinds of NGOs uh, that very often start a school. You may, um, it can be a private company and there are some other choices also. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always 
help people after having asked a lot of details about their particular situation, about the region, about the people there, about uh, their teachers, if they already have some, about their vision, and uh, about, about the group of people who are active. And then looking at all of that, I advise them to choose a particular legal form and even whom to put on which positions. Uh, because I think it's extremely important and people very, very often underestimate the, the legal part, the formal part. We think it's only a formal thing, okay. Okay, there must be a director, okay. Well, you might be director, okay. What about the, uh, the board? Oh, well, some three people have to be there, okay, the three people. Okay, it's finished and we can send it to the, the government. Mm -hmm. But then it is actually the people who, who do have official power. So whatever happens in the school as a problem, then the board or the director will has to uh, cope with that. And if it's only formal people, because they have got some formal, um, a formal, um, how to say that, um, they are entitled, for instance, somebody's entitled to be a director because he has got the right kind of education, the right kind of experience, and therefore he can be accepted by the state rather than other people who might be very good leaders but don't have the paperwork. Mm -hmm. Then very often people put some friend on the position of a director who actually is not going to do this job at all, but is just um, has got has got the right papers. Yeah. And then it's another person that is going to be the leader but not officially, because it's not possible. But then, after the first conflict comes, and you have always conflicts in the, this kind of school, then it becomes a huge mess. Nobody knows how to, how to solve that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I am advising them to take this thing seriously. Because having, um, having worked with dozens of schools and communities of parents, I know so many stories of disasters happening just because people don't take the legal system uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. So that's one piece of advice I give to them. Okay, really try to do it as much as possible the same officially as it is in the reality. Mm -hmm. Then there are other aspects as, for instance, um, how to create a common vision. Because the vision all of these people have is usually well, we hate the state school, we, we state the, the classical school, so uh, we are all on the same boat. But they are not, because very often it's, that's what they think until the school starts. And then the school starts, they start doing it practically. And then, very soon you see that everybody's doing something else. Everybody has some different kind of vision. It becomes, it becomes a, a huge chaos. But it's also something I tell them, that they should try to create a vision before the school starts. Yeah, and many other things, you know. Mm -hmm. Many things, even very pedagogical things, how to create a curriculum, how to, arrange, uh, how to make a lesson plan of a particular week, how to make a plan for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because nowadays most of the people especially parents who start a school, um, they don't decide to start a Montessori school or a Steiner school or a Sudbury school, but they kind of start something of their own and they are inspired by all of these movements, but they are not identical with any other one of them. And therefore, they, they don't copy the system. I mean, Montessori and Steiner, you have, you have a very much of a set system and you can just copy it. They don't say it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's very easy in a way. And because these people are creating something of their own, then they also have to create the lesson plan for every week, for every class. They have to decide um, if you teach children of the same age, if not, which age groups to combine, etc., etc. And as I told you, may, uh, very often mm, they may not be people with uh, experience in, in elementary education there. So yeah. that's why I'm also helping them with these things, which are quite complicated. To, quite complicated, quite technical, yeah. and very often also need to be adjusted after the school started, like half a year after that, uh, we may see that what I suggested or what you suggested is not exactly what works, mm -hmm. and then it needs an adjustment. And in some of the other areas also, you know, basically the paperwork is done, is okay, yeah. but then you have these pedagogical issues that become more important.
So that's the other job I do is that I am helping, I'm accompanying schools in their development, you know, in trying to solve up, so, um, to sort out whatever problems they have, you know, and that may go for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So you see it as a dynamic process. Yes. Is it something where, sure, you're going to set some yeah. paperwork and you're getting yeah. inspection that first year, but you expect, is it, and you anticipate, so yeah. you found a tool, it's going to have a transformative development yes. process yeah, yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and then perhaps even ongoing. I mean, that's one of the observations I've never had yeah. in the medical field is that a lot of times what we talk about is here's here's a time when you can't go into that the same time for the like the Brooklyn preschool, mm -hmm. you know, they were established for many years, a couple of decades, and, and then they realized they were in a different situation. So they sold the building and started a whole mm -hmm. you know, new era and got new leadership the whole thing. Yeah. So that's something I see that that's an extreme example. Yeah. Um, but what you're saying and what I hear you saying is that that's happens for all the tools, it's in the Sometimes it's sporadic, and sometimes it's you know, it's yes, yes, it, but it's always happening. Yeah. Uh, now, do you, you know, thinking about like, you know, there's so many variations of you know, democratic education, mm -hmm. there's social action, mm -hmm. there's social remodeling, there's yeah. do you, do you help them think through like how to be dynamic, like how to anticipate that and not have something so overly rigid that that creates a bunch of problems, or is that part of your conversation? Um, yes. Um, well, the thing is that, that they don't want to be rigid. I mean, especially in my country, being rigid is considered uh, like being stupid, being limited. Mm -hmm. So that may be more of an issue in some other countries, more to the west um, of our country. Um, anybody can imagine uh, some country of that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sort. Um, it actually um, becomes rigid, even though people have not planned mm -hmm. um, a rigid system. Dynamics that uh, very often you can uh, you can observe in the Czech Republic is that the people that start a school don't want anything rigid. They want something fl flowing, something fluid, mm -hmm. something chaotic in a way. Mm -hmm. But then, because of this chaos, so many problems emerge, and that the, these people get fear. The fear of that everything will dismantle. They will get into legal problems, financial problems. And the children will learn nothing, not even to behave or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And these are the very same people that were 100% for freedom, for no structure, and the rest of it. They only after one year of school running, they kind of swap sides and they they became advocates of a structure. Yeah. And then very often they overdo the structure, so they come to the other extreme. And then, then later is maybe the time to come to the school and help them to loosen the structure. Mm -hmm. So it almost never ha happens as a planned thing in my country. It, it is a result of a uh, of a reaction to mm, too much chaos. To the problems that arise. Yeah. 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 And even, it's no, not only the structure that changes, but it's very much, unfortunately, also the atmosphere. So while in the beginning it's a very joyful atmosphere with a lot of courage to do new things, mm, no fear is there, at least not consciously. Mm -hmm. Then um, everybody contributing, you know, there is a very free discussion. Then after this mm, wonderful period is over, the first serious problems come, the people don't have tools to solve them. Mm -hmm. So the only tool is like to tighten up the structure, to mm, like maybe elect somebody who will be the leader, who would be the leader of, of, of everything. Because very often in uh, times of chaos, people are seeking for a leader, you know. Uh, so why why is why did Putin take over twenty years ago in Russia? Because the country was in a, in a state of complete chaos, mm -hmm. basically not not being not governed by the government but by local mafia groups mm -hmm. that were also combating each other. So then the people have. The, um, the yearning for a very strong leadership. And the same what happens in politics also happens in these schools. Mm -hmm. So then you have an issue not only of a too strong structure, but also of a too strong leader. Mm -hmm. So I may tell you one of the, if, if you're interested, I can tell you one story uh, about one of the schools I was involved in. And also 
mm, the vision of the school is something that may be interesting for many people in the world because pedagogically it was extremely strong mm -hmm. uh, and it was something new. So um, that happened uh, some approximately, uh, yeah, approximately 10, 10 years ago, this, this school was founded. Um, so the story was that um, by that time you had two big rural Steiner schools in Prague, both within the state system, but because there is more and more uh, parents who want alternative education, that was not enough mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So many parents were not accepted into this, their, their children were not accepted because there's not enough uh, places for them. So they got very upset, but they said, okay, so we'll start another school, why not? Within the state system, which was actually successful. I told you that's very difficult, but they were successful. Um, because one of the schools in Prague had a school building, they, they had two or three school buildings, and one of the buildings was kind of empty, because in it was only some very difficult children, like classes for special, extremely mm. difficult yeah. children that were there. And the thing is that usually in such a situation, the teacher of the so-called normal, normal students or, or the parents, they don't want to mix with these difficult children. Mm -hmm. So there's a very, very strong opposition to fill, to fill this building. And uh, the director of the school wasn't able to do anything with that. But then somehow uh, these two, uh, some, sometimes the people, um, you know, the upset parents somehow met this director who told them about this opportunity and they said, okay, we don't, we don't mind. We are an inclusive school, so we don't mind about having some difficult children all in the same, in the same building. Mm -hmm. So, and it was also the only solution for the director of the school. So they started, and these parents, uh, they did not have a very strong vision, but uh, they did not know much about um, pedagogy, but they did feel that sometimes the water school, the rural final school is too tight, too organized, too structured, too authoritarian, maybe too dogmatic even. So there was something in the very beginning, like a desire to have a uh, Waldorf school with more freedom mm -hmm. and with less structure. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have any like specific, uh, any, any clear vision how to do that. So they just started. And it was one of those uh, <laughs> founding fathers <laughs> um, without, without a clear common vision. Um, that had a very difficult time from the very beginning. Uh, it's interesting that there were two ladies that came to visit me in my apartment in Prague and told me about this project. And I listened to them and I told them, well, what I feel, it doesn't seem that this book is already prepared. It seems it might be too chaotic if you start it right now. Well, maybe, well, I think it's better to wait, you know, I mean, it's still not convincing. It's a huge responsibility to do such a thing. Maybe first you should, I mean, you, know, you should create a vision, etc. So one of, uh, and both of them were my friends. They knew me. They so they, uh, for them, my advice was important. And one of them followed my advice and dropped off the project. Mm -hmm. The other one didn't and stayed. And there were also some other people in this founding circle which I didn't know. So they, uh, actually, one of the people I, I knew, but I did not know he was involved. Mm -hmm. So they started a school anyway. And the first teacher was somebody extremely alternative, extremely free, who had some experience of alternate schools back in Germany. Uh, so he knew something about Spanish schools. He also did know something about intuitive pedagogy and other things. And intuitive pedagogy is something very interesting, which is kind of a new thing, comes from Sweden. And it's very close in spirit to the democratic schools. So that's why I think it's, it might be important for whoever listens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but um, <laughs> what happened is that he's starting teaching the, the small children of six or seven. They might have been 20 or maybe a little bit less. Mm -hmm. And he gave them total freedom. Mm -hmm. And some of the parents like that. Oh, that's wonderful. It's even better than the Steiner school, I mean, than the classical therapy. 
but others less care. What is that? That is not a sinus school. In a sinus school, you have to um, make a clear structure, etc. It's too much. It's too crowded. Uh, where has the world of gone? You have promised to us, so you, you, you are cheating, you know. And there were conflicts that arose like one month after the opening. And still, I was not involved at all, you know. But then I got some strange emails because I thought it is some some mistake. It's not about me. Are some people quarreling with with each other? <laughs> what is that? Um, why do I have to read that? And I eventually understood. Oh, that's this school. It's about these two ladies. What they started. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. And then they were really <laughs> insulting each other in these emails. Mm. Kind of this group insulting the other group with very bad words sometimes also. And then I understood that what they thought is that um, they choose like five experts on Steiner education they knew in Prague, like the best experts to their knowledge. And they think, <laughs> they thought if they send these emails to us, the experts, it will be of any help. <laughs> <laughs> but they did, not, they did not even ask for help. They just right, sent these right. emails. So it was very interesting entertaining in a way <laughs> very dramatic yeah. and uh, that's it mm. so it went on having these conflicts and I was not involved in that uh, and after another half a year passed and what apparently happened is that even those that very much supported the teacher who was very very much into freedom very much with no structure um, very much into creative chaos the creative chaos was even hmm, was even uh, be seen in the way he came to school or didn't ha uh, didn't come to school. So he was very interested even in coming to school and not coming randomly. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that sometimes the children came to school and the teacher did not appear, and that was very random, and nobody knew why. So that was the point when even those that supported this teacher in the beginning very much, it was too much for them, too crowded for them. Mm -hmm. So then eventually there was kind of feeling, well, maybe we should take another teacher. Uh, by that time, the, the very Steiner people had already left because it was too much. They had chosen another school, this part of them. And then only, which was, I think, uh, six, no, maybe seven months after the, sc the school started, I was approached by one of the founder, one of the founding fathers. So basically, um, most of the founding people were men. Only this one woman that came to see me uh, that day, uh, she was the only woman. Basically, it was it was men. So it had diff diff different atmosphere than other other startups because usually it's it's still more more women than do the teaching and even founding the schools. He was like men dominated. Uh, there was a special flavor about that. Mm. Uh, so uh, the main, how to say that, the main person from the men group uh, approached me because he had known me because of some of the lectures I did three years before. And he said, um, okay, we have a very difficult situation like that. Um, but we don't know how to do it um, because whatever we do, the school can just collapse. It's very much of a conflict situation. And I told him, okay, well, actually no people uh, from intuitive pedagogy, intuitive pedagogy mm, professors, so to say, from Sweden and Germany, they are very good in solving conflicts of this kind. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they will solve it in a way that you can carry on. So invited Dieter Schwarz, who with whom I had already worked together on intuitive pedagogy in my country, and uh, we, we organized a session of what was supposed to be maybe two hours. Uh, we started 8 p.m. in the evening, and everybody, all important people, came uh, from the community, both parents and teachers, and all these founding fathers who were all parents, and. It was a long discussion, not two hours. It went into late night hours. It was over by 1 p.m., 1 a.m. in the night. And it was wonderful. 
because the teacher that was criticized for not coming to school, he actually, actually could understand the point of the others. Um, he even could understand that it is not possible anymore for the parents, this is too much. They have to look for a different um, teacher. And uh, so the different, as I said, that there were people having a different position there, but somehow because of Peter Schwartz and the intuitive pedagogy method of settling problems, they were all happy mm -hmm. at the end of the session. Even this teacher who actually, he was actually fired. <laughs> he was fired and happy, <laughs> which is very unusual. And it worked because in even in the long, uh, long run, it's 10 years ago, but even now, uh, they have some, let's say, some gatherings like uh, Christmas Bazaar or many other things. Sometimes they go for a trip somewhere. And very often they invite this first teacher mm -hmm. and he comes, he plays guitar, he's a very good musician, and it's all happy. Yeah. Yeah. So I was very, I, I, I served only as an interpreter uh -huh. because, you know, these people don't know German and he does not know Czech. So I just, I was... I was an observer in this process, but I said, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. And only then I started doing the same thing myself after having experienced that, that it works. So that was the first year out of that chaos. Again, they became some kind, kind, some, uh, some kind of a harmony. And very, very, very soon after that uh, session, the very same person, the leader, uh, told me, okay, could you please serve as a mentor to our school? Mm. And from then on, I became the mentor, and I introduced intuitive pedagogy uh, to the school, especially for teacher training, because I think it's the best method I've ever known uh, for teacher training. And so, practically, all of the teachers, and even some parents, joined in this um, path of personal self-development mm -hmm. that is called intuitive pedagogy. Not all of them one moment, because that was still a very few free communities, so it was not mm -hmm. like about imposing something on everybody mm -hmm. because somebody decides, even me. It was like talking about it, and some people got interested um, immediately, others not. So some people joined some of these teacher trainings, usually it's like four days uh, uh, from morning to evening, because it's, it's, a, it's an emotional development thing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, it's not just hearing to do something it's very much about experiencing so so we play a lot there do a lot of games social games uh, do very difficult things very dangerous things sometimes very funny things and that's the way how to develop uh, further emotionally how to open up you know so all of them eventually got involved and it was not it was never said everybody has to mm -hmm. and the people who did not participate in the beginning they were not looked down on so even that is a proof for me that is a good thing if it works this way. Mm -hmm. So there was very much the unity of vision after some time in that school. And it maybe it has become it has become the third world, the, the, the third school in the world that has um, adopted this kind of pedagogical model. Mm -hmm. pedagogy. There is a school, Sulvik school in Sweden that started uh, 50 years back and then another school in Germany that started some 25 years back that after some time quit this model mm. so we were the third or maybe the, the, the second existing okay. and it was just wonderful so we could actually uh, realize and do what the founder Per Albom dreamed of he dreamed of making a Steiner school without that, that dogmatic um, thing, without that tight structure, with, uh, with, with, uh, with freedom, with total freedom, but still not losing the good things the Steiner schools have to offer. You know? So he was a great visionary, and he, he actually thought that that is what he did as a school in, in Sweden in Solvik, that is actually the thing Rudolf Steiner meant. Mm -hmm. Because Rudolf Steiner, his, his first work that was which became well known was the philosophy of freedom. Mm -hmm. So he was a very strong advocate of freedom. His friends were anarchists, so the also anarchist movement in, in Germany and Austria. So why did it become so so structured, so so dogmatic at times? 
Mm-hmm. So it was like coming back to the roots of Spina Pedagogy mm-hmm. five years ago. And we also joined in. And it was very successful. I could see that uh, fl- uh, flourishing. And very fortunately, we could find teachers who kind of understood that kind of thing with their heart and could put it into practice with children. Mm-hmm. So like in that school, uh, even though most things are done in a circle together, um, it's n- there was never an issue if, if a child does not want to join in. Absolutely no problem. The children could, 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 uh, could walk out, could, could read something, could do something completely different, and it was not a problem, and they were not judged. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were not uh, worse than the others who do the thing uh, of the majority. Um, they were also, we started mixing uh, age groups also, which is not usual in, in Spanish schools. We started offering different things so that it was a particular lesson and the children could choose what else to do, which is not seen in Spanish schools for s- small children. And many other things. Uh, a lot of art was there, but more of a spontaneous art. Um, and the teachers worked together in a very different way because mm-hmm. everything, whatever was, whatever anybody had a problem, it was said in the open and we talked together as long as was necessary. So there was something like a sociocracy model, not voting and not having a, and not having a boss. So that was all successful, uh, wonderful, becoming better and better, and it lasted for some maybe four years. Mm-hmm. And then what what happened is that one of the uh, parents, uh, actually this this first founding father, uh, because he was also kind of mm, arrogant person at times, kind of a leader that was not very social in a way. He had kind of a vision, maybe subconsciously. He didn't know, he did not know consciously about the details, but he did have vision. In, in, in a way, he was the one that had the vision and wanted me to put this vision into practice mm-hmm. because I was the practitioner. So, but he was socially, he was not not a person that can cope with everybody and sometimes creating conflict, sometimes being being arrogant, and therefore he was voted. Uh, how to say that? Um, voted out, voted out mm-hmm. as a leader and there was somebody else and then somebody else and this new um, parent, this new father was somebody much more social mm-hmm. um, also somebody also much more interested in, in small details as um, lesson plan and, and everything finance etc so the thing, the management of the school became very structured and only then I actually entered in the role of entered the board. So there was a board of three parents and um, because this, the first leader was opted out, voted out, there was one place vacant and they actually insisted on my becoming third person, even though I was not a parent of the school. So that was something of, uh, something of an exa- exception. So I eventually agreed and then we uh, somehow brought very much stability into the school. So it became very stable, also because of the new leader who was kind of having this character. But the problem is that after three or four years, or two years, he got very tired. Mm-hmm. And also his wife was about to start a new job, so he had to be at home more also with the, with the children. And he had a, a job as, a, an, as an IT person, mm-hmm. a lot of work, and somehow he didn't, he lost energy. He didn't have enough time, and he was a very responsible person. So he actually started, he said uh, he has to calm down, he has to do less, you know. Mm. But the thing is that he did not hand it over to anybody, really. So what did not happen, there was no succession. And in the very moment when he took this decision of kind of letting it go, but not handing it to anybody, the the first teacher who who took who took um, the class of this of this interesting teacher after him mm-hmm. and who had done a very good job leading this group of children maybe twenty five children no around twenty children uh, for some five years no four or five years she she quickly um, 
a child ill, she's not, not able to come to school. And she did not even say how long she would be ill. I mean, that's logical. <laughs> and we did not know, but we did know it's something serious. Mm -hmm. So we did not know is it something only for one month or only two months or half a year or whatever. And even after one month, she was not sure if she's coming back to school. We asked her, but she did not know. Then after another month or, or another two weeks, she actually came back. But she still, she was still weak. And we asked, okay, what do you think? Are you able to carry on leading this class also next uh, next term? She said, well, mm, I, I can't decide. It's very difficult to decide. Well, uh, I do feel that I have some issues um, also back at home and not in my full energy. Well, but, you know, I, I don't know anybody to hand it over. Maybe, maybe no, I, I will overcome it. Whatever. She was not sure. And she was not sure during another three months or so, two or three. And the parents kind of lost um, trust in her because she, they did not know. And she could not decide. And then it's the moment where I stepped in and I actually told the other two people on the board, well, I think it's time to just decide that she will not be the class teacher another term because it's she, she's not able to decide. We gave her like three months to decide. We would probably accept whatever decision she she would take, but not, not being able to take the decision it means she's not able to lead the class in the future. And they actually accepted in one second. They did not ask any questions, even though it was a radical solution. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems that they have been thinking along the same lines, but maybe not having the courage to say that or, or to make that step yet. Mm -hmm. So they accepted and we talked to her and she was kind of angry in the beginning or did not like that. And But after two weeks, after the decision was taken, she was completely okay and she understood it was a good thing even for her. Mm -hmm. So the same thing happened, I think, with the first teacher, mm -hmm. I was so sure. So we were able to so, sort of vote her out without without something like an emotional conflict yeah, without the there. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was nice. But what happened is that by that time I was also partly a teacher there. I also taught some of the um, uh, some of the children, especially the old the old the older children. So I was a member of the teacher community, and when the teachers heard about my like deciding to vote her out, they some of them got very angry at me. So some of them got very angry because they thought it is a treason. So mm -hmm. one, you were part of us, you were our friend, and then now, without telling anybody, you kind of <laughs> killed one of us, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a betrayal for them. And, well, I explained, but still, there was a feeling, uh, well, that I had done something very, very bad. Mm -hmm. And especially for some of my colleagues. So then I reacted, I kind of withdrew. I was I withdrew from the position of being this pedagogical leader. I still mm -hmm. carried on uh, teaching. And I said, well, if you don't have trust in me now, well, it's better than somebody else takes over the meetings of the, of the teachers and whatever. And they start searching for somebody else. Actually, before taking this decision, we I just accidentally found a person that might take over mm -hmm. the class, and she said she might do it, she would do it. So we could go to the parents and say, well, it, it's not a disaster, because there is another very good person who will take over, but already from it. So they were also okay, mm, but you know the teachers were not mm -hmm. uh, because they thought they thought I, what I did was something very immoral. You know, because until then every time every everything was discussed in the open. But well, well, we actually did discuss that in the open for three months. <laughs> but sometimes somebody has to take a decision, but you do the decision without us. Well, <laughs> but I knew everything. I of course included whatever you said. So um, 
So there was a period of transition, and in the summer, so, so uh, several uh, months later, before the new term, uh, actually the person that I found disappeared, mm. like got ill and kind of disappeared. But there was another person, one of the also grounding parents, a woman, that found somebody. And then, uh, first, it was decided that she would take over this class. Uh, and then, because everybody was wary of this chaos, first, there was a lot of chaos. Second, there was a situation of somebody like me doing something kind of against the others. Mm, so, everybody wanted to, to have the harmony at, at back, back. So, what was everybody? <laughs> Uh, waiting for for a strong leader, mm. so there was a new candidate for the for the class leadership, and she was also approached if she could not be the leaders of all of the uh, of all of the teachers of the whole community actually, and she said she 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 might uh, she might be interested. Then there was a circle of around 30, 40 people with practically all the teachers and the most active parents, and. All of them said yes to the, to the proposal of her taking over. Mm. There's only one person that said, "Well, wait, wait, but we, we don't even we did not even define clear responsibilities. What is her responsibility? What is the responsibility of our us as the board of the parents and etc. It's 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 not prepared." Uh, but he was kind of overrun. That was the one that stepped down a little bit uh, as as a parent. You know, mm. was the only one to ask any questions. Nobody asked any questions. So everybody was so happy to to hand over the power to one to one only person, and I also also trusted this person because she was somebody who was who studied into the pedagogy three years until that because mm -hmm. the, we we had a like a study circle for directors of schools for personal development and she was a part of it like for three years. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, that's very good. She's a prepared. Well, she's not that knowledge knowledgeable about Waldorf school, but she did have her child in Waldorf kindergarten. And she's open, she's an open person, so that's not a great issue. And that was a mistake I made. Mm. Only la later I understood. I was not aware of that mistake. I thought I handed that over, mm. and that's not right. That's not the right way of handing it over. If you have a lot of trust in somebody and just hand it over, this trust is not always a good thing. Mm. Because I had too much trust, and I did not check enough if she has all the knowledge, all the skills she's supposed to have, if she really knows the vision and the rest of it. And what happened is that um, half a year later, there was the first upsurgence uh, within the circle of, of teachers. And <laughs> the very same teacher, who was so happy having her as the strong leader, said, what's happening? We can't decide anything anymore. It's one one person deciding everything. It's it's not the school we we, we want it to be in. What's mm -hmm. happening? You know. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of too late, and these uh, parents, uh, the board, they were only formally there. They actually withdraw because they did not. They were not involved in anything. Mm -hmm. They they just let her do whatever she did. So they did not help. They did not say, well, yeah, well, we are the guardians of the vision. Uh, this new leader, well, in some she does do some mistakes, and okay, so we should come back to our original vision. That did not happen, mm -hmm. but people were unhappy. You know, some of them very unhappy, and that's the way it stayed for for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I actually also gradually got out because there, it was not a good atmosphere, it was not a good situation, and I also having stepped down, handing over to her. It was her job or the job of the board or whoever to settle the situation, not mine. I, I had already handed it over, yeah. but not in the right way, in mm -hmm. the wrong way. So uh, I feel also very much guilty of the situation. But I was as intelligent as I was in the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I was not conscious of that. So if I could go back to that situation, uh, what I would actually do, I would insist of leading the school together for another year with this person. Mm -hmm. Really together, right. so that we have a gradual, um, gradual change. A, a, a transition. Yeah. yeah, and I even understand why I did not do that. I think I was intelligent enough to have this idea, but I was not in my uh, my intelligence was partly hmm, 
I should not because I felt guilty of um, you know of voting of voting out this this teacher in a way because everybody was like against me like many people I was kind of searching oh this was a mistake or whatever and I was not confident in myself mm -hmm. and I think that make also that also made a chaos in my mind um, because it's a simple idea so I, yeah. I, I I could not even get to this simple idea because I was somehow also not okay I did not really believe in myself mm -hmm. anymore really uh, because for some time I did believe I made a mistake mm -hmm. I don't think I made mistakes I think it was yeah. the wrong thing it was the right thing to do so because of being in a chaos myself I just missed the moment to do right. the right thing that's yeah. the way one of the things that, that uh, you talk a lot about trust and uh, one thing that I think is something to do is to kind of recognize that there's a particular way of looking at structure that I like mm -hmm. to bounce off people like yourself. Um, when you refer to structure, my, my sense is that what you're referring to is some kind of bank structure. Mm -hmm. Structure is around that, particularly around that part of the world. And is it reasonable to say that, that um, there's also a social structure? And that part of what the, that, that thinking about things like transition and, and leadership and, and how leadership uh, works is that um, perhaps what was what was happening there was that the social structures around leadership weren't as strong as they could have been, and so even though you had you, you, you talk about the idea of, of that sort of community of caring mm -hmm. and that sort of strong community relation structure that you meant in there as well. Is the one to move away from certain academic structures that you want to be strong and strong in the mm -hmm. and then and then what you were trying to help them with was social structures around leadership and then uh, you know pedagogical as well. Yeah. So it was and, and how to structure them socially rather than more academic. And so there's there's layers of structure in your story. Mm -hmm. So you have pedagogical structures with children, mm -hmm. you have uh, structures that the relationship between the board and the teachers mm. and, and the leaders there, mm. uh, and then you have structure just within the board in terms of leadership and, and who's leading and how they should lead, who's responsible for mm. what. So it's a really good story because it illustrates mm. the different levels. But my my point is, mm. um, and, and just if you if mm. do you find it reasonable to say that it's different types of structure? Mm. There's not just there's not just one kind of structure in the school. Mm. Pedagogical is not the only one, mm. but there's these other types of structure, mm. and that what uh, what what the work is, mm. and especially uh, yourself, is mm. you're trying to uh, help them work through how do we structure these other pieces that are not normally thought about. So, mm. so people until they have some experience and training like yourself, mm. they don't inherently think about structuring their board or structuring their the, you know the relationship between mm. the board and the teachers. Is that, is that yeah. You're perfectly right. Uh, I think you characterized the situation very well. So, uh, but there was actually not, there, there was never any, much of an issue about this academic structure within that community. Mm -hmm. Because from the start, it were these kind of people are kind of clear. Okay, the st um, the Waldorf structure is good, but we have to loosen it to some extent. Yeah, loosen, so yeah, yeah. the structure, the academic structure of the curriculum of the lessons and all of that was basically a loosened Steiner school structure. Mm -hmm. But it was still enough of structure. There was not chaos. There was a healthy kind of mm, little bit of uh, there was the healthy degree of freedom there. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, one day every week, the children did not go to school, but rather went um, to open nature, mm -hmm. um, making fire, preparing food, um, doing games, etc., which you would not have in most Steiner schools. Yeah, but basically, more or less, it was a Steiner school structure. So there was never an issue about that within the community. Yeah. Of course, what the real Steiner school was, people said, that's not real Steiner school. It's too loose and it's not really the thing, you know. But within within the community, there was an understanding. So the issue, as you rightly has, have observed, is was very much the social uh, social structure, and that's what I tried to bring in there, and what I did succeed in bringing in together with the other two parents who were on the board. So from the complete social chaos that was there in the beginning, there was very much of a stable social structure. And for me, I would I would think of another level, I may phrase it differently, 
in you is the legal level. Mm -hmm. I did not speak about that, but it actually did play a role. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's something very subtle to understand that uh, for most people, even for me. So we have the legal level, which we kind of forgot about mm -hmm. because <laughs> we were a very strange thing. So we were kind of a private, um, private community school within a big, within a huge state school. Mm -hmm. So it was like a world within a different world. And interestingly enough, the director of the big, uh, big state schools, of which we were only a small part, he gave, gave us all freedom to do whatever we do. Mm -hmm. The only thing he was interested in was, uh, what about the teachers? Do they have some diplomas? But he was also very generous. And the first three teachers or so, I think they didn't have any diplomas. Mm -hmm. So he all, he all thought, oh, can at least the fourth one have the right diploma? And he did, she did. Mm -hmm. So that was the only thing, he, and then he insisted on these people starting at least and pedagogical study in the university to, to have this diploma later. But otherwise we were completely free, it's mm -hmm. incredible. And uh, even quite a lot of money was collected by the parents to support this like more, this kind of education is more richer, the way you have to care after every single child, etc. So the teachers actually got significantly more more money than like in other science schools mm. who were, that were within the state system. So we also did care about the teachers to give them energy, you know, because so that was all wonderful. But mm. what happened when these problems came, even these social problems, for example, these teachers are going, not going, um, me taking this decision of where to go, some people being angry about that. Of course, the director of the whole school, he observed. Yeah. And and then there was another teacher at the end of the term that just disappeared because she, she, she got a sudden burnout. Mm -hmm. She was one of, it was maybe the best teacher of the school. Mm -hmm. She suddenly got a burnout and did not even say goodbye to the, to the students or the parents mm -hmm. to another situation. And then he was just fed up with us. Mm -hmm. I think I can't take responsibility for that anymore. Now you must have some some clear responsibility, some clear structure. So he stepped in very very um, very strongly, mm -hmm. and um, he actually appointed this person, this new leader, as the class teacher of the class. Um, like first, without the other people even knowing. Mm -hmm. So there was something that was not decided by the community, but by himself, together with one one, one parent who was kind of secretary. And it was the first time that something happened with, with no knowledge of the others, which was mm. also you know, not, not, not that good. So there was something, um, a moment that he, in a way, stepped in very strongly and put this person there uh, to have some structure, to have some responsibility. And she later became the deputy director that was responsible for this alternate part of the school. And mm. she's still, she's still until, until yeah. this day. So that's how he stepped in. Yeah. And I think, and many people, part of the community got angry and was not did not at all agree. Said so that's not what we wanted. Now it's the director led school. What is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually his will that is there through this, you know, other lady that is kind of the leader. Mm -hmm. So there is another part, another level that the people were not conscious of, mm -hmm. and were yeah. were then very much surprised. Yeah. Yeah. They did not understand it from the very beginning. We were and only allowed um, to do that, to have this freedom, if we are kind of reasonable enough for the system. Right, right. Because he was responsible for anything we did mm -hmm. in terms of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that was not at all in the minds of the people. And they mm -hmm. were then taken by surprise. But actually, do I understand this? I understand this director. I mean, it's maybe not the best way to do it, but you have a crisis situation, you have a little time. Um, Actually, there was everything was happening very fast because, as I told you, there was another candidate for this for this uh, class to take over it was agreed upon. Mm -hmm. But then she disappeared, and it was only 10, 10 days until the, the beginning of the first, uh, next term. Mm -hmm. So we had to do something quickly. Right. So you can't do a very slow democratic procedure, mm -hmm. you know. So yes, especially in the moments of crisis, everybody sees. Uh -huh. We have a legal system, it exists, it's not That's only it. in a paper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think all of these uh, all of these levels are very, very important, and that's basically my work. 
yeah. I'm making aware, I mean, making communities aware of the second and the third level. Very rarely they are aware. Mm -hmm. Though, because it's, there have been also other people, not only me in my country, uh, having done this job, in general, there is more consciousness in these schools now uh, about these aspects. So I think that many of the new, newly founded schools are kind of wiser. Mm. They are aware of these aspects. So they may not go through all the conflicts other schools went. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the benefit of having someone yeah. like yourself to yeah. just carry that. Yeah. You know, one, just awareness that yeah. this has been separate. Yeah. And then two, two, to bring in them that yeah. And help people understand yeah, because yeah. this is really complicated stuff. Yeah. Um, but there are ways to understand it. Yeah. And there are you know, lessons to be learned as we learn the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a good feeling that like in the ten years I'm I've been into this job, the whole the whole community of other schools, other parents, it has kind of risen to a higher level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. acting not only out of a gut feeling, but also having more of a Understanding of the broad um, responsibility of have all the connections, all these layers, mm -hmm. it has uh, it has it has gone much um, in the, to an upper level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there is something like collective wisdom that is being created there, and you don't only have one particular school and its life, its development, but you have a life of the whole school movement in the Czech Republic uh, that is also a living thing. Mm -hmm. is uh, um, making mistakes, learning out of this mistake, etc. And that's why I came to IDEC and the other meeting, mm -hmm. because I want to see, oh, and how is the world moving going? Yeah. How is the world move, uh, moving, uh, learning from mistakes? How is it evolving? You know, And I want to compare it with whatever is happening in my country. Mm -hmm. And I actually do see, basically, it's, it's very much similar. Mm -hmm. So the developments I could observe in detail in my country, I also see them happening elsewhere, hearing the other participants of this meeting. So it's very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's a, it is a global thing. It is a global awakening. Exactly. You know, exactly. Like all these other people basically very much acting out of their gut feeling, even in other countries, in the past maybe 50 years. But now is a time that people become more conscious of whatever they do, more self-critical, mm -hmm. more, more actually accepting the fact that every every single one of us do a lot of mistakes and that we have to learn and, and never stop even though we ha might have had 20, 30 years of experience in these kind of schools. Yeah. So this, this kind of feeling, again, we are, we are, we are, we are beginning again in a way. We, we don't, we know nothing. On a deeper level, we still know nothing. Mm -hmm. We are not sure of what we do, if it's the best thing. I feel it's it's very much everywhere. I think it's a very good thing. Mm -hmm. it, it brings us to a higher consciousness. Right, and I think for me, it's, yeah. it's I, I have the same sense. Yeah. Um, but I think you know part of the putting this agent of school project yeah. together is partly about how do we share those stories just like you do, mm -hmm. uh, um, but also then start to develop that sense of collective wisdom about it. To rather than coming here and hearing. Very, you know, one person's story, another mm. person's story, but then to see, wait a minute, there are some ways that we are doing the same thing, mm. and can we be better at, mm. at sharing that with each other and helping people to avoid the mistakes we make, mm. to, to anticipate them? And, and, and one of the ways that, that uh, you know, I, I want to help change the language we use is to think about structure, not just at that pedagogical level, but think about the layers. Mm. And how do we align the layers mm. so that they're consistent with what we understand for the children, mm -hmm. works for the teachers too. Mm -hmm. It has to be aligned the same way. And the board members, like you said, you have several people who just suddenly burn out and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and poof, you've got a problem. Can we, and, and then you have the board member whose life circumstances change and it creates a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, that's life. That's the, <laughs> you know, that's how life works. So how can we, you know, the bigger picture here is, Mm. How can we develop these understandings and ideas mm. so that, yes, we have these ideas about pedagogy, but we also have not only pedagogical structures that we're learning to implement to make things different. We're using structures at the teacher level to mm. help nurture the teachers and, and to nurture the board members. So it needs to be consistent and aligned. Mm. And we understand life happens. You have to have a succession plan for the board. Mm. You know, just as an example, a succession plan for teachers. Mm. You know, 
those kinds of things that are current regarding this kind of organization, and we know their dynamics. Mm -hmm. So if we know that's going to happen, <laughs> you know, can we anticipate them and help each other to actually have that happen? Mm -hmm. you know? So that's I think that's I think a part of the bigger picture that that this one is that this one is crazy. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yes. Helping people think through. What does it mean to think about multi-level structures mm -hmm. that have to interact, all those levels interact together? Mm -hmm. It's very complex. Okay. But so so appreciate your yes. <laughs> your sharing the story with us. Um, we need to wrap up. So um, is there like ways that people can reach you and talk to you and, and, and share with your website or social media? How, how do people reach you if they want to know more? Yes. Um, I just. Um wonder how to tell you the website because uh -huh. there are main letters in that it's basic to check uh, yeah. uh, i actually do have a card with me uh -huh. i can show the card sure well then we um that this is both audio and video so okay, okay. so anyway anyway so uh i will um i will tell you in czech because the official name of the institute is in czech uh then i will translate it into english and then uh, i will tell you how to find information so my uh, the name of it, my institute is Institut pro podporu inovativního vzdělávání. Um, in English, the translation is Institute of Innovative and Alternative Education, and um, you can find uh, mm, the website, uh, which is has only a, has also a uh, English version. And uh, you can uh, find a Facebook uh, channel, uh, Institute of Alternative and Innovative Education. And the easiest way how to <laughs> find all of that, you can also find me on Facebook, uh, Pavel Kramer, P P A V E L K R A E M E R. And through that, even there are only I mean, there are only three people on Facebook with that name, so very easily find which one is me. And also, you can find different articles or videos, whatever, on YouTube, my lectures. And if you are persistent, you will get to all, all, all information. Like most information is in Czech, mm -hmm. but I did do some talks also in English. And the website is translated into English, as is the Facebook page. Yeah. Or there is another way. Uh, maybe the uh, easiest way, which just came to my mind now, <laughs> you just contact Don, yes. and Don has all the information. <laughs> so, so there's the easy way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So would, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in our distribution, so so it'll be the on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, I'll have more of the notes uh, yeah. there, and then on Podbean, I'll also have more of the description and go with the links there. So. Yeah. So, I would be happy um, to come anywhere in the world and help you with. Um, with your school starting, with your schools developing. Uh, I've already planned uh, probably to come to New Zealand around February, March. It's still not set 100%. Yeah. And I do come to India regularly. So um, now in August, I went to India for my fifth time. Mm -hmm. And I also do work in schools with schools there. But I would be also very happy to discover other, other countries I have not explored yet. Okay. I can speak um, English, German, French, uh, Spanish, Italian, and Russian, so I can also work in some of these languages, whatever the country is. Perfect. All yeah. right. Thank you very much, Pablo. Yes.